Have your seat. Sure. So thank you for sharing that very moving film with us. Um, I think my first question is, and you had mentioned earlier that this isn't your only Holocaust film you've made, um, and you're obviously a father, you're not Jewish. What made you want to do Holocaust education and Holocaust films to begin with? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I, I think I was exposed to a Holocaust uh, class going through the seminary and that kind of sparked an interest. And, um, and then when I heard about the story of the Auschwitz retreat and Marion's story, it just, it just had, these are stories that have to be told. Mm -hmm. And we had to, we just had to tell them. So that's kind of what sparked the, the movement toward that. And did, I guess, a two part question, how long did you and the team have to interview Marion? How many hours of footage do you actually have? We have probably about eight hours of footage of interviews with him, sort of. But it was very interesting when we first went there to film, he said, well, I don't wanna, I don't wanna be in the movie. Mm -hmm. You just film my artwork and it'll speak for itself. But every time we were in the labyrinth and he was there, he'd come over to me and he'd say, now let me tell you about this mm -hmm. drawing. And I'd call the crew over and bring your mics over and let, cause he would explain something. Um, so we probably had I'm, I'm, I'm maybe about four or five hours of interviews with him. Um, but there were, three, there were three sources of his commentary, because this is all his either written word or spoken word for, for our interviews. Um, we did inter interviews with him. Um, and then he had a, what we call a coffee table book where he had a, written an introduction, a long introduction. So we used some of that. And then there were his, uh, his testimony that he gave to the Auschwitz Museum in Auschwitz where they interviewed all survivors, as many survivors as they could to hear their stories. And that was about a 20 page document that had that he'd given his testimony on, and then that recalled, and then there was a fourth um, source where, like when we saw at the very end, there's a door with Polish on it, and uh, <laughs> one time Jason said, "Hey, Dad, don't you think we don't know what that says?" So we had that translated, and then that ended up in the film. I should point out because Dr. Berenbaum, when we do this. He always says, he, he says, now let me explain why Father Ron has a son. And um, I entered the priesthood after the death of my wife. And I have three sons, seven grandchildren. So yes, it was, uh, I, I entered late in life. <laughs> now you may not have an answer for this question, but when he was talking to you about his drawings and you were sort of following him around, did he ever share with you why he chose to draw his drawings in the way in which he did? Not exactly, except as you saw at the very end, he, he was an artist um, from the get-go. Um, and um, uh, as a young man, he was an artist. He drew, in the, he drew drawings for some of the camp people. So he was, that was his, his art, artistic metier, so to speak. That's what he did. He was an artist and um, and he was a set designer in Poland for film and theater. So he had had a long career of artwork. Now I think I want to point out when you see the drawings, of course he, he started his drawings after he had a stroke and he had limited mobility of his arm. So he was only drawing on pieces of paper like that. And you can see them all pieced together. I don't know how he managed to con con make it all contiguous and contiguous, but he did. He, and um, he, that's, I, I think that, as he said, part of it was to get his rehabilitation of his hand going, and then he needed to tell the story. So we started in, as you mentioned, 1993, drawing after so many years, and he did not, as you can see in the film, he did not stop. He, um, the, the, 
I've been told at one point that was the largest uh, amount of pen and ink drawings in the world uh, because as you saw, every, you know, just little sketch, little drawing, little pen and ink marks. I don't know how he did it, but uh, he, he did it in his apar small apartment in, in Gdansk and sometimes um, at, at the uh, museum where, where his, at his exhibit. Do we know how many drawings he did in his lifetime? Specific no, I, the... somebody's counted, but I don't recall, okay. yeah. Um, can you talk about um, how his drawings ended up at that church and where the name Labyrinth came up from? He, he started his drawings and then they were shown in Dangst, or Gdangst, uh, any Polish people can correct <laughs> me, they were Polish. But um, he started drawing there and then somehow he, he must have been staying with the monks at the uh, Harmage Monastery at some point. And I think that must have been the idea to bring that, what he'd already drawn, to the basement of the church. Um, being involved in our exhibition and reading so many of the testimonies of the survivors and hearing family members tell their stories of the survivors, you know, most people only survive three months. And if you survived three months, that was pretty much unheard of. He was on the first transport to Auschwitz. Right. He was prisoner number 432. I think it, the film says he was there five right. and a half years. Did he ever talk about how he managed to survive? He did. He, he told us a couple of things. Um, one, I think, was his faith. Mm -hmm. His Catholic faith helped him. He said his imagination helped him. He said, I could imagine life after this. And so, in, and I think his artwork. And then recently in the past couple of years, because I keep doing more reading about him and research, he never mentioned this. It's not any, it's, maybe he mentioned it in his testimony at Auschwitz, but he was um, caught doing architectural drawings of the camp for the resistance in the camp. Uh, there, was, uh, there will be a movie coming out. There is already a movie in Poland about Captain Pulaski who um, went into the camp voluntarily to document what was going on in the camp. And um, so there was a resistance in the camp. And Marion has been doing sketches of the camp and smuggling them out. And one day he was caught. Now normally, you would be shot. I mean, that was, but every once in a while, and we did this on another, found this out on another documentary we were working on, the Nazis would send you to a trial. And he was sent to a trial, um, and now I, the name of the prison escapes me, Opel, I think, um, in Berlin. So he was sent there, where life was easier in the prison. He got three meals a day. And he was there for a long time, like eight or nine months, in between the time he was in Auschwitz. Then he was shipped back to Auschwitz, where he was found guilty, shipped back to Auschwitz, condemned, he was going to be executed. And it's a little vague how this happened, but he had shared his soup with another inmate. And then when it came time to document all this, the inmate switched the notes and said he was already dead because the guy was taking, he was the, in char the, the inmate that he shared a soup with was in charge of keeping track of who was going to be killed and who wasn't and he put him, he changed, you know, put him in another stack. So he, he survived that. But I think there was a point where he was in prison in Berlin that really helped him uh, because he got a little bit of his health back. He got three meals a day. He even drew drawings there. He, he, um, he just, he had this need to draw and he did some drawings there and he, it's a story that is uh, reading this. He did a, a drawing um, for one of the SS officers and the officer brought a picture of his son and said, would you do this drawing of my son who's in the Air Force? And he did a picture of him did a drawing 
And then maybe two weeks later, the SS officer came back and said, well, I'm glad I have that drawing because my son was killed. And so he, he was always somehow drawing, uh, even in the camps and even while he was in prison. So talk about the production of this film. How long did it take? What was your process? Well, we, um, when we decided to do the film, we had to make contact with Marion and get permission to come to the uh, monastery and the basement. Um, and then I had a, a, a German Jesuit filmmaker in Munich who provided us equipment, as we, the, the, uh, some of the film equipment. We brought some of the film equipment on our own because as, as you could see, the Schmitz were highly involved in the film. My brother is a filmmaker, as a, a cameraman. Uh, my brother's an editor, my son's an editor. So we had a lot of Schmitz uh, helping to uh, finalize the film and also do the filming. Um, we were in the labyrinth for about five days, but we did come back to shoot some other things about, I think, three months later. It, all in all, it took a little over a year to get it completed, and um, at one point, um, we decided we needed music, obviously, and um, I got a hold of the, uh, again, in the Polish community here in LA is fairly cohesive and small, and somebody recommended Marek Zabrowski, who is the Chopin, in, head of the Chopin Institute at USC, and he agreed to do the score, and then gather the um, uh, musicians together. And uh, we we had a we 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 had a deadline because I discovered somebody told me actually a nun who was a film reviewer said Ron this has Academy Award potential. And I said, really? Okay, so then I found, tried to find out. I said, how do you, and I told you this in the green room. I said, well, how do you, how do, you do that? How, do you, how does it qualify for an Academy Award? Well, it has to be screened in a theater. Well, there are a lot of theaters that I could rent in LA and screen for a couple of days, but the International Documentary Association had a film festival, we submitted it, and if it filmed, it screened there, then it would qualify to be submitted to the Academy Awards. So we were able to, to do that. So there was a, it became a crunch time for Marek Zabrowski to write the score and then uh, record it. Uh, so we could meet a deadline to get it in to the International Documentary Association to qualify. So I'd say it was a little over a year that everything came, finally came together. Now, you released the film in 2010, and he passed away in 2009. Right. Did he ever see a finished project? He did not see the finished project, but he did see footage when we were at, uh, at, at the monastery in Harmage when he was there. We showed him some footage, and his reaction was um, very touching. He said, well, now I really feel like an artist. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So a moment ago, you talked about the score and the scoring, um, and there was a, um, I don't know, I didn't count, five seconds, 10 seconds, somewhere in the middle where the music just stops and the camera pans the labyrinth and all the artwork. And as haunting and moving as I found the music to be, I found the silence to be even more so. Um, what was the reason, or how did you choose to do that? <laughs> Jason Your decided son. that. <laughs> he was the creative force behind it, and he decided that. He said that we'd have silence at certain points. In fact, my brother, the cameraman, after we gave him a, a, a screener of it, he said, you, you're missing, there's silence. You can't have silence in there. And, you know, we don't have silence in movies, but we did, and Jason made that call. And you're not the only one. People are very touched by that. Yeah. It's really amazing. Yeah, it's a brilliant move. Um, so as we saw in the film, he didn't talk about his experience for almost 50 years. Once he started drawing, do you know how soon he actually started also verbalizing what happened to him? No, except I think once he started drawing and, um, and the word spread, there were... Um, uh, exhibits in Gdansk 
um, where I think then he talked, he talked about it. I know that um, he had a number of times. He started, I think, probably started going back to Auschwitz as a survivor witness after the stroke, I think. In 19, so every year on January 27th, um, he would go back to Auschwitz and talk uh, about his experience. And then whenever anybody came to the exhibit, if he was there, he would talk about his uh, experience. So I mentioned it in the introduction um, that we had the Auschwitz survivor, Toba Friedman, and she said, I share my story, so it becomes your story. And I have now said that. I don't even have enough fingers and toes to count how many times I've said that because I find it so powerful. Um, towards the end of this, I now have my new powerful statement, and I'm pretty sure I was sitting next to you in the film, and I'm pretty sure I heard you say it out loud when it was said on screen, mind the scales. Um, I found that to be such a powerful sentiment. Right. Did he share any more about um, how that idea and concept and meaning should be applied today? Um, not exactly. Let me tell you where the mind, the scales. He felt very guilty. There is a point, and it's in the drawings, but he doesn't mention it. And, but it's a very um, awful moment. When they had to do a march as all the inmates around the grounds one day as punishment, and I think it lasted over 12 or 15 or maybe 24 hours where they just marched and marched and marched. And if you fell, nobody could help you because you'll tumble in. So he had to walk over some of these people. And he felt very, he felt that it, it stayed with him his whole life, that he couldn't help them and that they were dying. And um, so associated with mind the scales, that's what he said, the decisions you make, and you've got to weigh them. And I know that um, I did take the film, or we did take the film, to the Museum of Tolerance. I said, I can't make a film about the Holocaust without running it by somebody, uh, the Jewish community. So Rabbi Cooper, um, and I forget the other rabbi's name, not Marvin Heyer, but they watched the movie. They were very struck by Mind the Scales. Mm -hmm. um, and they said, we have no real comment. I wanted to make sure we were very sensitive to the Jewish community. Um, but just Mind the Scales, touches a lot of people. It's, yeah, so you, powerful. Yeah, he just says that, yeah. So why is it important for people, audiences, schools, to watch films like yours, to see exhibits like ours? Why is that so important? Well, I don't, you know, historically, we need to know what goes on. And the way I would relay it to students is, this is bullying to the max, if, if for lack of a bit. This is what bullying is. It's taking advantage of the other. It's, it's being cruel. It's, it's um, destroying, destructive. Um, but more importantly, I just think it's important that our students and all of us become aware of what really went on um, and how, um, how a little bit of it, it became normalized in, in, to people, mm -hmm. to the SS there, to the Nazis there. I mean, they, they felt no guilt, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, those that were arrested later on um, but by the Israel uh, police in Argentina, some didn't, didn't care. We're, that's what we're told to do. And uh, they were proud of it. Um, thank you for that. Um, we are now going to turn to you in the audience to ask any questions you might have for Father Ron. Um, we do ask that you raise your hand. We have someone in the audience with a microphone. We are filming this, and the only way for the cameras to pick up the question is through the microphone. We have a question right there. All of the in the Hold on, I don't think the microphone is on. Whoever's in the back? Try that again. He 
he did tell us that he tried to remember everyone, that, that these were real people he was drawing. Um, so he was very conscious of, of, do, of making sure that he at least was drawing real, you know, from his memory, real people. They just weren't sketches of his imagination. We're gonna go over here. One is, um, I, I didn't hear the response about how they came up with the name The Labyrinth and what it means. Um, and what happened with the Academy Award nomination? Mm -hmm. Did you get it? <laughs> well, we submitted it, but we didn't get accepted. We didn't get in competition. Um, he calls it The Labyrinth because it is a maze as you go through it. It's a labyrinthine maze of, and you can go in different directions, you can come, but the, Ultimately, you go behind drawings. You, he, he was a set designer, so he, you know, he did um, uh, bunks. He used, uh, you saw the, the stones at the very beginning, which is um, a, a tradition in the Jewish community to put a stone on a, head, on a grave site. Um, so he, he designed it uh, very meticulously, and it kept enlarging it. And at that one point, um, he died in October 13th, 2009, and in the Maximilian Kolbe room, which you saw actually, now his, his remains are interred there. He was gonna, he said, I, I have been so influenced by Maximilian Kolbe that I want to, I, I want to be buried there in his, in that, there was a separate room that featured all the image, uh, many of the images of Colby. Are there, up oh, over here. If you said during the introduction, would you please refresh my memory, uh, how did you come about to meet this Mr. Marion? How did I meet him? Yes, how did you, how did you find out about him, you and your team, your sons? Well, okay. Um, <laughs> I started, uh, my German Jesuit filmmaker friend called me one day and said, um, he was getting his uh, degree from the New York Film Academy in New York, learning how to be a filmmaker. And he had to make a um, film uh, for his thesis. And he called me up and said, I'm going to make a film about Bernie Glassman, a very famous Zen uh, Buddhist master. In, um, it was in Massachusetts, and he said, would you come and help me make it? And so at that point, we went to make the film about Bernie and his uh, work. And at that point, they said, oh, and you know, we do a, a retreat at Auschwitz. And both of our heads snapped back. I mean, we know about retreats and you know, religious retreats. And we said, you do what? Mm -hmm. You actually go to Auschwitz and pray? and ritual, do ritual there and remember people. And so my friend uh, Christoph and I looked at each other and said, we gotta make that movie, that documentary. So when we made that documentary, that's when we went to the labyrinth and met Marion. Uh, and then it just followed on from there. Great question. Oh, there's um, extra all the way in the front. I was struck by how many figures are in almost every drawing. There are a few that are in the film that maybe have two or three, but most of them are piles and piles of sometimes live bodies, sometimes dead. And did you get the feeling of claustrophobia um, while you were doing this, I mean, it's in a labyrinth anyway, and it, it, it gives you, gives one, I think, a claustrophobic feeling. I don't know if the prisoners felt that. I, um, seeing the, the drawings in real life, I, I know, I'm, I think he wanted you to feel somewhat hemmed in, um, but, um, I've never heard anybody say they got claustrophobic feeling, I, and people who, who have been there. I will say that uh, I just want to put in a, 
pitch for Dr. Michael Berenbaum because he's the one who, who got us here. Um, he takes groups to the labyrinth now at least once a year whenever he does the March of the Living at Auschwitz. Um, and uh, people who go, are, are, they will tell you, people will tell you that this was more meaningful than being on the grounds of Auschwitz itself. They just get a sense of, of uh, the horrors uh, of Auschwitz by, by, by being in the labyrinth. Um, I'm sure there are some people who just, you know, can't stand to be in there, um, but I've not run into any of them. And we're gonna go also in the front row here. Yes, um, did you, did, did you felt personally impacted by this uh, experience in making this film and how has it affected you since? It's, I've been asked that question before. I always have a hard time answering it. So, it, you know, when I watched the movie this time, and, and I, I was talking to Jason, and they said, we ought to watch the movie again because we haven't watched it in about a year. And he said, well, we're going to watch it at the, 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 the screening. Um, I guess it's, I hate to use the phrase, man's inhumanity to man, but it, it it did touch me, you know, not having watched it in a while um, and having watched it a lot. Um, I guess it just, it, it, you know, touches your empathy, my empathy, and says, you know, how do we how do, we do something about this? Um, how do we make people more aware of this? Um, I do want to say, you know, we, you asked about the Academy Awards, and but at least we got it on PBS, okay? <laughs> you know, we did have it on PBS for a while. Um, it, it's, uh, it's just sometimes leaves me speechless, to be honest. It just touches me, and it's like, wow, I'm, you know, I'm glad we were able to do this. Um, I... I think of Marion often and his wife Helena and what he had to go through. Um, we showed it at the Museum of Tolerance um, at, the, at, at a big screening and uh, they asked the same question you did, were any survivors there? And I was mixed in the audience. And the woman next to me stood up and there's something about being the presence of a survivor it, it just, I was, I was like overcome. I, I was like this woman right next to me. And even though I've been, spent time with Mary and a survivor, yeah, there are no words. You, you, you know, you, you can't, I could never find the words. I still couldn't find the words. I'm sorry. Just nothing seems to, so you're, you're really in, in when, to me, in the presence of a survivor or a survivor's story, you're really in sacred space. It's like, I, what can I do to honor you, to, your, your struggle? Um, I do want to talk just a little bit about Marion's life after Auschwitz. Because uh, it's, it's, it's still amazing. He, he ends up going to the um, Art Academy in Krakow. Um, as an artist and then late and then the early 50s I think he finishes in about 1950 and then becomes a set designer um, for uh, in mainly in Gdansk and and there and this is why one of the reasons I'll, I'll I digress for a moment the reason he he and other non-Jewish people were rounded up were because the Nazis went after the elite intelligentsia immediately to take artists, teachers, government officials, military, anybody who might resist in any way. And I just looked it up because I had to remind Jason. I said, Jason, would you look up before I go? The Nazis had a list of 61 
5,000 people that they wanted to round up in Poland so that they could get rid of any resistance, whether it was mayors, whether it was teachers, whether it was artists. So they already knew that they were gonna round these people up. Marion went uh, because he was, uh, he was arrested as he was trying to get to, um, to join the resistance in France, the Polish resistance in France. He was arrested, sent to a prison, and then sent to Auschwitz on the first day it opened. But after 19, in 1950, then he started his career as a set designer. And after 1945, Poland was communist. So as an artist, and he was doing a lot of things in the, in the theater to poke the communist regime in the eye. Um, and there's a famous, um, he told us, there, he did a, a, a set design where there was a lot of, it was junk cars, just lights going on, set design on the stage, a pile of junk cars. And it was meant to be, you guys are a bunch of junk, you're a junk heap, you communist. And ultimately at the end, the, the cars come together and form a cross and said, it was like, we will overcome. We will, we will get you. And one time he tells the story, he says, and um, they, the communists didn't like me. <laughs> and one day, I, one of them came into my office and uh, with a gun pointed at me and said, you're not going to do this anymore. He said, what, you, you're going to shoot me? And I'm, I'm an Auschwitz survivor. You're not, you can't do anything to me that hasn't been done. Uh, and I guess the guy backed down. But uh, so his, his career, and he did some um, uh, drawings uh, mocking the Communist Party, uh, cartoon, draw, cartoonish drawings. So he, um, but he stayed, you know, in Poland and uh, managed through his artwork and through set design to, to mock the Communist government. And, and just to, ask another question on that. Um, I have had the fortune to speak to about a dozen survivors, and most of them have said they didn't want to go back to where they came from because there was nothing left for them. Right. They didn't want to go back to the neighbors who had turned a blind eye to them, um, and so immigrated to another country and then ultimately to the United States. Mm -hmm. Do you know why he chose to stay in Poland? Well, I think there may be a difference between a Jewish survivor and a, a non-Jewish survivor, and I think, um, I, I don't think there was much left for him, um, but I think he felt that he needed to stay on for whatever reason to, um, I don't know, be able to mock the communists and, and for his artistic career. And I imagine he had family that he wanted to, to see. Um, so I think uh, the, certainly Jewish survivors, mo many, most, I, I don't speak for them, but left. I mean, there was nothing, you know, left for them. Was he the only one in his family who was taken to the camps? That I'm, that I'm aware of, yeah. yes. And he, he was taken to the camp. Um, well, he was arrested. He had, he mentions in the film, his Boy Scout ideals, his high patriotism um, want, made him want to go and uh, join the resistance. Um, and it's interesting, we, as we continue, even now continue to do research, the, the equivalent of the, we call them Boy Scouts, they call them Scouts. He was a scout in, in his age. Um, the Nazis almost immediately banned any scouting. You know, the, another, another source of resistance, another source, an organiza, organization, highly organized. The Scouts of Poland were highly organized at that time. And uh, so uh, his friend that he uh, buried, basically, um, Marion Kaidash, um, I think was one of his friends in the Scouts. And uh, they, there was a team of them, about three or four, that decided to join the resistance. And uh, after many problems of uh, a train wreck where he was injured, uh, finally getting to Krakow to to uh, join the resistance where he was arrested. Um, 
So his, his strong ideals and patriotism and all that he'd learned, you know, made him pretty vulnerable. Uh, so we'll do a final question right here, Scrap. Thank you so much. Um, on that same vein, you know, he was subjected to so much trauma and kind of haunted by these images, but yet it doesn't sound like he came across as traumatized or haunted, almost maybe had found some peace or something. Could you just speak I'm a little more? A so she said, could you speak obviously a more his background of being in the camps would have been very traumatizing. Right. And so she asked, but in listening to his story, he didn't seem so traumatized. So how, how was he? I, you know, maybe there was a little um, denialism. In other words, I'm not going to uh, fall under this until his stroke. Uh, he did say that the many themes of his artwork and set design referenced uh, the grotesque experience. Um, so I didn't get a feel, you know, of any, uh, except that when we were with him, one day uh, his wife came, we were with him at the monastery in the, in the exhibit in the, in the labyrinth, and we were at breakfast and she said, well, he can't come down now. He had, they, they call, he, he had the terrors last mm -hmm. night. He had uh, Holocaust terrors and so it stayed with him, but maybe not, he was indeed traumatized, but um, he did find um, with his wife, Helena, a, a true, I, we were, we had one young man with us while we were filming in the apartment, a young Polish boy, a young man. We came downstairs and he said, boy, are they in love? <laughs> he said, that's real love. I mean, he, he sensed it and that was, that kept him going, I'm sure too. Yeah. The love that he had for his wife and that relationship. So I want to thank you, the audience, for coming out and watching this today, but I more importantly want to thank, thank you. you, Father Ron, for sharing the film with us, for sharing your thoughts about it. Um, we're now going to move right into the lobby here, and he will actually sit down and talk with you. Um, we have copies of his DVD for sale. He will sign them. So we encourage you all before you leave to stop by the table in the lobby, and we'll ask you just to sit in your seats for about 30 seconds while we get him out there, and then yeah. you can all come. So thank you so much. It was an honor to have you here.